Do you remember the first time you ever heard about Jesus? Well, I don't remember exactly. Uh, I'd heard about God and a few things, but didn't make a connection, I guess, if I'd heard about Jesus or not. But uh, anyway, I guess I was a little bit older before I really heard about Jesus. I remember being touched at Christmas time. I remember hearing Christmas songs and thinking, this is just wonderful. Uh, little boy, I didn't know what was going to go on the rest of the year. I didn't know how long it was going to last, but it sure seemed good at the time. But uh, I'm glad that one day somebody told me about Jesus Christ and the fact that his blood can make sinners clean. Amen. I, uh, I do remember, however, the first time that I knew about death or dying or even that we do die. Uh, I didn't know any of that. But uh, my sister Margaret told me one time uh, about the fact that if I die, uh, in fact, she was telling me if you, if you chew gum when you go to bed. Now, I don't know where we ever got chewing gum back where we lived. They, there wasn't much of it ever come our way. But uh, somehow I got hold of a piece of chewing gum, and I was, I don't even remember somebody had used it before I got it. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where it came from. But uh, what I do know is I'd gone to bed that night, and that scene is as vivid before my eyes as, as you are, just vivid right now. And uh, she came, that old upstairs bedroom, and, and uh, told me good night. And she said, what do you have in your mouth? And I told her. And she said, well, you can't go to bed with that in your mouth. I said, why not? Well, you might choke. I said, what's that? Well, it's, it's when you uh, get that hung in your throat and, and you can't breathe anymore. So then what happens? Well, you die die what's that <laughs> and she she did her best to explain to me what dying was about uh, and she's the first one that taught me to pray and I never forget different house different scenario different scene all together and one night she said to me I was six years old and she said to me George it's time for you to learn how to pray well, as far as I know, there was nobody else in my house that was praying. I didn't know anything about praying. I never heard anybody pray except one time before that. And uh, she said, uh, wouldn't you like to know how to pray? And I said, well, I guess so. Well, here's how you do it. Now I lay me down to sleep. And so we went through that. For the longest time, I repeated that little prayer every single night before I'd go to bed. She told me I should, and so I did. But... Uh, I'm so glad that one day I found out that it goes beyond that. And uh, I could put all of these things together, death and dying and eternity, and a Christ that died on a cross for my sins. And I learned how to pray, Jesus, please forgive me. The first time I went to the altar, I didn't really know how to pray. I came and knelt down. If it was in the old New Florence Church about here, I knelt down there and tried to pray, and your dad was there in revival at that time, Dora. And uh, I didn't know how to pray. And after a while, I figured it out, and so I just began to cry out, Jesus, save me. And that's all I knew how to say, over and over and over, until finally other words began to come, and I kind of got it together. But I'm so glad tonight that Jesus loves me. Praise God. Uh, some people might have considered us heathen. Somebody must, might have considered us ruffians. I feel sorry for the neighbors, or felt sorry for the neighbors later. We moved from the country to town, and, and we were used to climbing trees and running over fields and and uh, getting dewberry briars hung between your big toes and going out through the barnyard and getting your feet messed up. And we was used to all of that. And we moved to town. And uh, in the country, if we wanted to yell, we yelled. 
We went to holler at somebody on the other side of the yard. You didn't walk over there to talk to him. You just yelled from where you're at. But uh, now we moved to town, and we're right on Highway 19 in Wellsville, Missouri, the big metropolis of about 1,500 people. And next door lived a, a gentleman who had been the city policeman, Mr. Cooney. And, and uh, I can visualize that dear man in my, my mind even now, and his parents owned a funeral home across the street over on the corner from our house. And uh, I've told you before, and I'm not going into that tonight, but I remember the day they told me that Mr. Cooney had died. He'd, had a heart attack driving his real pretty 47, 48 Plymouth down the road and, and uh, they're in town and has had a heart attack and car run off the road and when they got him out, he was dead. But uh, I'm sure we must have been an aggravation. But anyway, God brought us from there, brought us to the cross, brought us to the church Helped us to get saved. Praise the Lord. Isn't God good? Amen. All right. As we pray again, let's uh, let's pray God God's will to be done, and He'll direct us and help us and use us somehow. Every now and then, I have a thought that goes something like this: If God helped me when I was so so far away from God, when my family was that far away from God. There must surely be other families somewhere that we can reach. And may the Lord direct us to those families. Pray for Carolina. She stayed quite a while after church this morning. And, uh, and among other things she told us, I think I finally figured out that she thinks she can be off work every other week. And she said, I'll see you not Sunday, but the next Sunday we'll be back. And... Uh, she told us, so I think what this church needs, I like this church so much because it's small, but I think what this church needs is young people. And uh, I, I think you all need to get young people. So anyway, we agreed, of course. And, and she said that uh, she didn't have friends. I don't have anybody to invite. Well, I do have one person. I'll ask them if they can come with me. And uh, so pray for her as she tries to know how. She says that she wants to live for the Lord. And uh, so she needs the Lord's help. Amen. All right. Unspoken requests? What about Faye? What about Faye? I wish I knew all the answers, Jack, but I don't. What I do know is John said that she's terribly discouraged, apparently, that... Um, I understand that they're not going to church and have not for a long, long time. And if I understood him right, Jan, you might be able to help me out. I don't even know if you were there when I was talking to him, but if I understood him right, he said, you know, they move around a lot, and they're talking about moving back to Arkansas. That's really as much as I know. But uh, she's not well, and... Uh, She's much too old to be forgetting God. And she needs the Lord's help. But that's about what I know for right now. All right. All right. Well, let's, let's stand and uh, pray together. Heavenly Father, we're looking unto Thee again tonight. We thank Thee, O Lord, for the love of God. Lord, we thank you tonight that we know that the word tells us more than one place and more than one way, thou art no respecter of persons. And so, Lord, when we think about Faye and Mike, we know, Lord, that you love them. We know that you care what's going on in their life. You know exactly what they're facing. And so, Lord, we pray that you'll reach out to them, that you'll Visit them tonight, even, O oh God, and talk to them about their uh, their needs and about their spiritual welfare. Lord, we want you to raise them up and bring them close to you and just uh, be real in their lives. Lord, we want you to touch Sister Faye's body tonight. Give her healing. Give her help. 
Lord, I want you to remember Carolina tonight and the girls and bless and help and encourage them to, uh, to mind the Lord. And, oh, God, we've asked you many times to have your way about her work situation. And we ask you, oh, God, again tonight that you'll just uh, be with the, the person that makes the decisions there where she works. And let it work out, oh, God, if you will, please, so where they can be in church more often. May thy will be done, O oh God. Lord, we're trusting tonight that you'd remember uh, Lori's cousin David, that you'll be with him and help him work in his life. Show him, Lord, just what you want him to do, where you want him to attend services. Bless him, Lord, with your presence. Direct him in your will. Reach out to Bobby tonight, O oh God. And Lord, where, whereby you've been pleased to raise him up and help him to be well enough to get out of the hospital and go home. And Lord, we know that thou art big enough tonight to talk to that man's heart. You can convict him of sin and convict him of ungodliness and of sin and righteousness and judgment that I tried to preach about this morning. Lord, just be with David tonight and uh, help him. But Lord, remember Bobby as well and bring them, oh God, to a place of victory. There's so many others that need your help as we thought of Ron Griffin today. And oh God, we, we don't know where he's at any longer, but we know that you know. And I pray, Lord, that you'll deal with Ron and help him, oh God, to, uh, to really sell out to follow Jesus. Lord, we want you to remember Heath tonight, dear God. Uh, we can only imagine how, how it must be to live uh, outside the realm of grace. But Lord, we pray that you'll help Heath to know there's a God in heaven that loves him, that, that will forgive of all sin, of all unrighteousness. Lord, that God can wash him clean and make him pure and white as the snow that Dora talked about this morning, Lord. Oh, God, reach out to Heath and to Bruce and Donna and bring them in, Lord. Oh, God, we don't want them to be lost. We don't want them to be uh, living without you. We just want you to bring a peace and joy and contentment into their hearts and into their lives, oh, God, and help them to get some things settled. Uh, that they want to go to heaven more than anything else in the world. Oh, God, help them out, we pray. <laughs> be with Gary and be with Olivia tonight. Remember others that we prayed for. Remember this child that we prayed for earlier, uh, Marquis and Brandon's friends. Oh, God, will you help in that family and just comfort them and help them and strengthen them and heal them, O oh Lord, all for your own glory. Show, us, show them thy will and thy way, O oh God, and direct their every day and direct their prayer life and, and their, their lives for you and just use them, Lord, for your own glory. Bring blessing out of all of this situation, we pray. May thy will be done even here tonight. Bless your word again. Hear and answer prayer, Lord, for we love you. Much that we want to see done, but, oh God, we know that we have got a God that we serve that's big enough for everything that we can bring because you can do more, exceeding more than we can ask or even can think. We'll give you praise for it all. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Anybody have a song tonight? Testimonies? Amen. Something you want to praise the Lord for. Praise God. Well, I think I figured out when you all don't want to say any more, it's up to me. <laughs> so pray for me tonight, please. Amen. I'm not naive enough to, to think that you all come just because you're so anxious to hear me preach. Uh, I understand that. 
But I want to tell you, there's nothing I'd rather do when the Lord helps me. And there's nothing I'd rather not do when the Lord doesn't help me. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <clears throat> when I started to serve the Lord, when, when I finally made up my mind that live, die, sink, or swim, I was going to have to preach because that's what God was requiring. I told the Lord that if he would help me, that I'd do my best when I was asked. I'd sometimes go to church praying nobody would ask. But uh, Brother Gerdeman would ask almost every time I went to visit my folks and visit the home church, Brother Gerdeman asked me, now George, did you bring a message today? Well, no, I, I'm afraid that I didn't. Well, could you think you could get a message this morning? Well, if the Lord will help me, I'll do my best. And so that's kind of how I got started. But I'm glad tonight that there came a time when I settled it in my heart that I would preach for the Lord until he told me to quit. And he hasn't done that yet, so I'm still trying. And God is... God still helps from time to time, and I recognize that. My brother Dave Whitehead, Dot's husband, uh, was a boy who grew up on the streets in St. Louis. They moved out to our community, and uh, Dave found out about Dot, I guess. He was friends with the boy that lived down the road. It was another family from St. Louis that moved out to the country just to get out of the city. And these two families bought these old farms, and uh, uh, the one was next door. Uh, Dave's friends were next door to us. And uh, I found a real good friend in a, in a little boy named Lynn Tiepelman, and I've often wished I knew what happened to him. I have no idea where he's at. But there was several children in that family. Some of them were adults, really, still at home. But Dave and uh, John and Ed Tiepelman were good friends in the city, and so they were good friends when they moved to the country. And Dave came over to see the Tiepelman boys, and on the way to their house, he passed our house, and I guess saw my sister Dot out in the yard, and became interested and stopped by. And I was a little boy, six years old. I don't think I'd started school yet. And uh, Dave and Dot got married. And, and uh, when they did, I thought there was nobody in this world like my, my brother-in-law, Dave. Uh, my brother, Charles, had been my idol. And he was in the armed forces and gone from home. And, and Dave took his place. And uh, uh, he would bring me toys, and he would talk to me. I think part of that, he was trying to bribe me to go in the other room and let him and Dot talk. <laughs> but uh, I didn't know any better, so I just stayed put. And uh, anyway, uh, Dave was around when, I mean, not physically around when I got saved, but but uh, he was in our family, and... and uh, we had been close friends and and uh, close as brother-in-laws. And when uh, I uh, <clears throat> got saved, I Dave was there one day, and I said, "Dave, I've got to go to Montgomery City." And he said, "What for?" And I said, "Well, I, I need to go up to Montgomery City and make some restitution." So he said, "What's that?" And I told him, and he said, "I'll go with you." And that wasn't exactly what I wanted to hear. I didn't really need anybody going along to listen. But Dave went. And when I pulled up to the first store and I said, I need to go in here and make some restitution of the, the owner. And Dave said to me, if you don't mind, I'll go in with you. Well, okay. <laughs> and uh, I tried to lose him in the store and... Uh, that didn't work, and he stayed pretty close to me. And uh, Mr. Bothy came over, and I told him what I was there for, called him a name, said, Ralph, I'm here. 
uh, to make restitution have gotten saved. And when I was a teenager around town, I stole some items from your store and I need to pay for them. And he said, well, George, I, I had no idea. I would never, ever believe that of you. I, I just trusted you completely. I said, I know you did, and that's why it's hard to be back here today to, to confess. But I want to go to heaven, and uh, I need to, to take care of some things. And he said, I have no idea. I wouldn't have any idea about anything. I didn't know you took anything. Uh, just Why don't we just forget it? I said, no, i tell you what. If you'll get a ticket book, uh, pre-computer age, you know, and I said, if you'll get your ticket book, Ralph, and, and just walk with me, I think I can show you uh, each item that I took. So I walked around, and it was three or four or five items, and I paid him for them. And we walked out of that store, and Dave said, so that's how that's done. And I thought, well, this is not the first time he's heard about it. He may not have known about it, but he's heard about it enough that, uh, and I caught myself praying for him. Lord, he probably has some restitution he needs to make, too. And uh, later on, Dave got saved. And... Uh, I remember standing by his bedside the last time I visited with him and I got ready to leave and he said, George, I want to tell you something before you go. When I married your sister, you were a little boy and I never had a brother, but I got several brother-in-laws, but you've been the closest thing as a brother to a brother as I've ever had. And I want you to know that I'm going to be leaving here in a few days, and I don't know just when. And I don't want to tell you goodbye. I just want to say so long, we'll meet again. And uh, that was precious words to me. And so I'm glad tonight that I know that God can help us through all that we meet And help us to make it to heaven. Praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles, I'm looking tonight by the Lord's help at the first chapter of, of First Thessalonians. And I'm not sure, but I may be hung up here for two or three services uh, before I get through to the final thoughts. But for tonight, let's start in the first chapter this is just kind of setting the stage for maybe for more for what I want to preach on later but uh, <clears throat> let's take a look at this uh, I don't want to say this is a completely new area to the Apostle Paul but uh, he and his group are traveling through the country you know they they go over to Philippi the uh, he had heard the um, the Macedonian call in a vision and uh, the man saying come over and help us and and uh, it wasn't where he had intended to go but it's where he went following the Lord and so we find a direct a direct uh, reference to somebody minding the Lord, going the way God wanted them to go rather than what they had intended to do. And that was the case with the Apostle Paul. And uh, he opens a chapter here saying, Paul and Savanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he's writing to a church that he says uh, that they are in God. In other words, you know God. You're, you're a part of God's plan. You're a part of God's work. Uh, you're a result of people obeying God and trying to live for God. Praise the Lord. Then in the second verse, he said, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing 
your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. Praise the Lord. Well, it's one thing for us to give our testimony. It's another thing to have, have uh, somebody else say something about us. But it's quite another thing to, to know, absolutely know, that God approves of the way that we take. It's quite another thing to be clear in the eyes of God. Uh, the Bible talks about the devil being an accuser of the brethren. Well, it's one thing to be accused of something. It's another thing to be guilty of that thing or something else. But God has a way of clearing the record. And, and I tried to tell Heath yesterday, Heath, God can completely, completely wash your record clear and forgive every sin that you've ever committed and make it just like it not happened. You'll remember, but God won't. And we talked about that this morning as well. But uh, Paul said here, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. And I want to comment on that just a little bit, perhaps uh, uh, make reference to it a little bit again later. But Paul has been to this church. Uh, he's seen this church established. He's seen these people pray through in our terminology. He's watched their lives change. He saw them grow in grace. He's seen them become established. And one day he establishes them as a church. They're recognized now as not just a group of believers. They're recognized as a church. Jan and I talked recently about uh, what's the difference between a mission and a church. Well, either one can be a body of believers Either one can be people who love and serve and follow God, but, but a mission is uh, uh, primarily is a, is a group of people that have not been established into uh, a church yet. They, they are not known as, uh, in the strictest sense of the word, they're not charter members or they don't have a membership except in the kingdom of heaven. And so therefore they are a mission. But when they establish and elect officers and and uh, get a, a church board and so forth. Now we're recognized as a church, maybe same group of people, a different day. But Paul was there. They were established as a church. Now Paul goes on his way. We know that he, he travels all over the place. He's gone a lot. He's, you know, he has no certain place really to call home. Uh, he's much like Jesus was in that sense of the word, but he's just traveling around. There is a place in the Bible that talks about all of the bad things, the, the hard circumstances that happened to this, this man, Paul. And, and he lists some of those, shipwrecks, perils, beatings, uh, all those times that he felt the lash of the cat or nine tails on his back. And, and then he says, besides all this, the care of the churches. All of this, the care of the churches. He carried a burden in our language for the churches. He was concerned about all of these people. Uh, we're told that Paul probably wasn't married. I don't know that, but, but we're told that most likely was the case, and maybe so. Uh, perhaps he had had a wife and she had passed on. I don't know what his real circumstance was. But what I do know is that he had, as it were, a large family. He, he was so concerned about each one of these churches. Sometimes it was a little group. Other times it was probably hundreds of people in one location. But Paul carried that weight on him wherever he went. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. I remember one time Winston Worman said that we, when he was on Papua New Guinea, he said, I came uh, in prayer often enough, but he said, but I didn't have time just to kneel down and tell the Lord everything that was on my heart. I had so many things I was concerned with. And he said, so I just 
was kneel down there at a chair or at an altar or at a stone or wherever it happened to be. And I would just say, God, you know about them. You know about this one. You know about that one. I didn't even take time to mention everything that was on my heart. I just said, God, you know. And he said, you know what? If God knows about it, and he knows that I care enough to even mention their names, I believe he's going to help those people. And so uh, Paul might have been somewhat like that. He, he knew thousands of people. And we know that he didn't have time probably to mention them all by name, but he prayed for them, he says, without ceasing. And uh, <clears throat> here in the fourth verse, it says, Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. And so he knew that things was well with them, that they had settled some issues, that they had, uh, they had made some vows to God, and they, they were walking the way the Lord wanted them to walk. And, and then he says, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. And so they became examples to all of that region. And it would seem, and I believe this is so, and having been on uh, the little island of Grenada for a few years, uh, I never figured out how it could happen. But if something happened in St. George's, and there were hardly any phones up in the country, but it would almost reach up there before you could drive a vehicle and get home because the roads are so bad, it'd take you an hour or so to get there. By the time you got there, they might already be talking about it at home. Now, how in the world that could happen, I always wondered. But then one day, I recognized, and Valida used to call it the Grenadian telephone. Uh, Sheila and Pastor Smith lived a quarter of a mile or more from us. And every now and then, Valida would say, well, I need to ask Sheila something. And she'd go out in the backyard put her hands up like this and say, Sheila. And after a while, I'd hear, yes, sister, prior. And they would talk back and forth, up and down the hills, just like that. And so sometimes Valida would say, when you pass by, stop in, need to talk to you. And uh, or she would say, are you all right? And so that would go back and forth. Well, that's kind of how Grenadians related before they had telephones. And, and so uh, word would pass. Something would happen in Victoria. There could be a car accident. There could be a, uh, somebody got robbed or beat up or whatever. And news traveled so quickly that it uh, wouldn't be long there. We would know about it. Didn't have to read the newspaper. Didn't have to... Uh, eavesdrop on the telephone or anything. You just heard about it. And so Paul says that the people all about the region, Macedonia and Achaia, all knew because they were examples. The eighth verse said, For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God were to spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. Praise God. Isn't it wonderful that we can live in such a way that people just know that we've been to Jesus and learned of Him? Isn't it wonderful that our life so changes that people just know that we have decided to follow Jesus? We live the life. We uh, we just don't talk the talk, but we walk the walk as well. People looking on know. They know you, Brandon, where you work. They, they know how you live. Um, you don't have to go to work every day and tell them, well, I'm still a Christian this morning. I, I still love Jesus. I prayed before I left home and 
I'm okay for the day. You don't have to tell them that. They know that by just watching you and, and uh, listening to your talk and knowing it's different than the world. Praise the Lord. I like that old song that says, it's different now. Amen. It's different now. Uh, and so they knew uh, these people so that we need not speak anything for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you. And so there, there are people in other places that are, that are telling Paul and talking to his group of people about uh, uh, what's happened over in Thessalon Thessalonica and how ye learn or turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Praise the Lord. They were an example to all of that region about them that their life had changed. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. And I like how he says that, how he finishes up. But he lets them know that we also needed salvation. We needed to be saved. Even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Praise the Lord. And aren't we glad tonight that uh, this is a no-so salvation. Belita's Uncle Merle used to include that in almost every testimony I ever heard him give, which were quite a few. And he would say, I thank God for a no-so salvation. And so tonight we, we can know it. We feel it. We sense it. And uh, we live it. Praise God. And so thank God tonight for a real no-so salvation. I'm glad tonight I'm not in the church of God just because my mom and dad were. And therefore, I, I believe I'm a Christian because my mom and dad went to church all the time. So therefore, I must be all right. I'm glad it doesn't work that way. I'm glad that we know it for ourselves. Praise the Lord. Thank God for the night I repented. Thank God for the night victory came. Thank God for that night later on when I got sanctified a few years later. Praise God for that time when I knew. Joyce said it was all settled. Praise the Lord. And uh, I've tried to witness to some people across the years. And... Uh, I wish they would have all taken the Lord, taken the way with the Lord. They haven't. But I'm still hopeful for some of them still living and that someday they'll get in and get going. All right, that's as much as I ought to say tonight. May the Lord bless you and give you a good week. Uh, just pour out his spirit to you. Praise the Lord. Besides that, keep you well and keep you from falling out of bed. Amen. We don't need any more people bruised up around here. <laughs> All right. Dora wouldn't tease you if I didn't think you could take it. <laughs> All right. Let us stand.